This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. According to a recent report, psychologists are beginning to realize that they were wrong to tell people to be selfish and that human beings are happiest when they are thinking about others, according to a Duke University study. What we find now is that people are happier when they're generous, caring, and concerned about others, declared Dr. Michael Wallach, professor of psychology at Duke, who did an in-depth study of this subject. The theory of being selfish reached its peak several decades ago when psychologists pushed the idea that selfishness, self-expression, and self-fulfillment were the only ways to real mental health. But we found that people who do this often are not happy. And happiness is needed for good mental health, said Dr. Wallach, who co-authored this five-year study. The people who are happy are those who are generous and caring about others and have moved away from being totally involved with themselves, he said. The reason why is because it is in keeping with our nature to be unselfish. We are built in such a way that we really do want to care and give concern for others. Not to give play to these feelings is to go contrary to our nature, end of quote. The greatest secret of happiness known in human history is love, kindliness, and forgiveness. Vera Emmert Johansson, the poet, has written, I pointed a finger at one of my friends, for his faults I could certainly see, but then in amazement I looked at my hand and saw three fingers pointing at me. Judge not, said Jesus, that you be not judged. Consider this incident from the life of Jesus. Professor J. Patterson Smythe has written, The guests were all reclining on couches around the board, their feet resting on cushions. And suddenly a passionate sobbing was heard. A woman with unveiled face and hair unbound, the sign of a fallen woman, was kneeling on the ground behind Jesus, in her hand an alabaster box of ointment. Her tears were raining on his feet, and she wiped them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with this ointment. Her emotion was intense. Simon the Pharisee was greatly scandalized. His respectability was compromised. What business had this wanton woman in his house? The whole thing was shameful. The woman's touch, a pollution. Evidently, he was too polite to express his feelings, since Jesus did not seem to object. But he was free to think his thoughts, and he thought hard thoughts. If this man were a prophet, he would certainly have known what manner of woman this is that touches him. And his thoughts were evident on his face. At any rate, Jesus read his thoughts and spoke out straight, Simon, I have something to say to you. With grudging respect, he answers, Master, say on. Simon, says Jesus, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 pence, the other 50. When they had nothing to pay, he forgave them both. But now which one of these two will love him the most? Well, I suppose, said the annoyed Pharisee with an air of indifference, I suppose he to whom he forgave most. You have rightly judged, said Jesus. Now, Simon... Do you see this woman here? I came into your house. You didn't even offer me water for my feet. She has wetted my feet with tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss of greeting. She, from the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil you did not anoint, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loves much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And then he lays his hand on this sobbing woman, at his feet and says, My child, your faith has saved you. Your sins are forgiven you. Go in peace. Or more accurately translated, go into peace. There is a profound personal peace in knowing that you are loved by God, that you are forgiven by God, that the mercy of God surrounds and envelops your life, that God is your father and your friend, and that God has a wonderful purpose For your life, the person who refuses to use his or her God-given potentials because of fear and doubt is like that old farmer in Kansas who had two windmills but decided to pull one of them down because he was afraid there was not enough wind for them both. The fact is God's resources in your life are unbounded. The kingdom of God is within you. A fragment of God's very spirit indwells your mortal mind this moment. One of Robert Ripley's Old, believe it or not, cartoons pictured a plain bar of iron worth $5. This same bar of iron, when made into horseshoes, was worth $10.50. If made into needles, it became worth $3,285. And if turned into balance springs for watches, it became worth over a quarter of a million dollars. The same is true 
of another kind of material. You, the material of your life, your time, your energy, your personality. By the power and purposes of God, your life can be put to important uses. If you will dare to pray the prayer, God, it is my will that your will be done. Jesus called humankind to commit ourselves to God. That word commitment is from the Latin comitere, which means to connect, to connect your will to the will of God. Remember, I used to do a joke. Years ago, I had a hobby of ventriloquism. I had a little ventriloquist dummy. And I would say, where were you born? And he'd reply, in Kansas. And I'd say, what part? And he would say, all of me. And when you are reborn by faith in God. That's how to be reborn, all of you. When you give yourself to God, that's how much to give of yourself. Give all of yourself to the transformative touch and the embrace of love which your Father God has for your life. You people who've played football know that as an offensive broken field blocker, you throw yourself at the person you're blocking. Or if you're a quarterback running an off-center line plunge, you don't send the ball out ahead of you while you run the other direction so that you won't be involved in the fray. No, you take the ball in your arm and you throw yourself through the line. That is exactly what Jesus is asking spiritually, that you throw yourself into what you believe, into the wholehearted service of God. Be involved in this experientially yourself and come to know the joy firsthand, not vicariously, but firsthand of living as the son or daughter of God you are. On one occasion, Jesus called a young man to make up his mind. He said, come and follow me. But that young man turned and sorrowfully walked away. Every person must face that decision ultimately, whether to follow Jesus or turn and walk away. I call you to the choice, to the decision, to follow what this Jesus of Nazareth taught and the way he lived his life in joyous love of God and love of others. Those were the two great commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In wholehearted commitment, according to an ancient legend, there was an old Saxon warrior who said he wanted to become a follower of Jesus, but... When he was immersed in the water at the time of his baptism, he held up his right hand to keep it from getting wet because he said he wanted to be religious all except for his sword hand so that he could still do battle and kill and plunder with it. But Jesus says if you're going to follow him, hold nothing back. Make a total commitment. One summer when I was a little boy, I went over to a neighbor's house to borrow some butter for my mother, and I stood there in the doorway with the screen door open, and after I'd let in about 13 flies, a couple of dozen gnats, a wasp or two, the neighbor lady became irritated with me and said, well, are you coming in or aren't you? So I came in, closed the door. Well, sometimes when a person is standing on the threshold of faith, on the threshold of real commitment to God, that person needs someone to ask that question. And that's what I'm talking about on this radio broadcast. Are you coming in or aren't you? Make up your mind. Decide. Dare to give your life to God. All of it. To enter the kingdom with full decisiveness and discover the full range, the full spectrum of the joys, the privileges of living as a beloved child of the universal Father of all. When I was in high school... I won a speaking contest. The first prize was a trip to Washington, D.C., and I recall standing during a tour that we took in the office of the Secretary of Defense of the United States, and I noticed that there were several telephones on his desk. Three were black, but the fourth was bright fire engine red. And I asked an official about that. He said, that telephone is a direct line from the President of the United States. When it rings, everything else stops and it gets top priority. That's what Jesus was talking about, giving God top priority in your life, seeking first and supremely to do the will of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, said Jesus, and all other things worthy will be added to you. There's an old Japanese legend that a certain peasant died and went to heaven, and in his wanderings came to a room all full of jars, shelves with nothing but jars. And in the jars were dried and mummified human ears. And when he inquired about this, he was told that 
Those were the ears who belonged to people who lived their lives on earth, who had heard about the good way of life, who had heard spiritual truth and the better way, but who did not pay any attention to it, so that when they died, only their ears had gone to heaven. Jesus said, blessed or happy is the man who hears my word and obeys it, puts it into practice in daily life. In ancient Rome, women used to compute their ages from the date when they got married. But I heard one time a variation of that. There was an old man who had heard me preach, came up to me afterward and said he was 28 years old. Well, he looked nearly 80 if he was a day. But then he went on to say that it was 28 years ago that he had given his life to God. And he said he really hadn't been alive until then. So may it be for you. When you give your life to God, you really come to life inside and you really begin to live. A driving school instructor once told me most people had trouble learning to do U-turns. It's also one of the most difficult spiritual maneuvers. But when you're going the wrong way, you have to do a spiritual U-turn. It is called repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. On March the 26th, in the year 1918, during World War I, when General Pershing placed the American army under the command of the French General Foch, who had just been made supreme allied commander, he wrote this memorandum, quote, Infantry, artillery, aviation, all that we have are yours. Dispose of them as you will. End of quote. Dare you say that to God? To say talents, abilities, my very life itself, all that I have, all that I am is yours. They are at your disposal, Heavenly Father. Do with them as you will. If you make that commitment in this moment in your life, your life will never, ever be the same again. And then write to us at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviate it, SRI, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer, all this literature yours with no cost, charge, or obligation. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Venom Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.